Hi friends. In the final part of Narrate series Our Father, Adam starts a conversation on the last part of the Lord's Prayer. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Adam asks the question, what if God gives us permission to ask that we not face difficulty? This week was a little nutty for me, and so that's a little bit of an insecure um, apology. I, I got to be a part of a memorial service on Thursday, and so I say all that to say this morning as we wrap up this uh, series called the Our Father. If you've not been with us thus far, I would highly recommend the podcast. Uh, but personally, and I said this in an email this week, this is the content for me personally that, that struck the deepest, that challenged the most. And yet I'm a little bummed and yet trusting God that it was also a, a zany week where I just, be, between a memorial service on Thursday and then ales on Friday, I didn't get to do all the work I would otherwise like to do. And so I'm saying all that to say, like a first grade teacher, uh, like you're going to need your thinking caps this morning because I think the content is very, very good. And I think that the delivery mechanism will leave something to be desired. So <laughs> will you just work extra hard this morning? I'm indebted to Dallas Willard uh, on, on all of this. And for me, all this came to fruition a couple months ago. Uh, it was in February. I was finishing up a trail run, which is absurd to say, but that's kind of the winter we had around here. I was coming off Mount Helena down the Reader's Alley or Reader's Village uh, Road about 15, maybe 20 yards from Park Avenue, so it's fairly steep right there. And as I was coming down, I did something that I'm, I suppose all of us have done at some point, but I, I took a misstep. And you know when you like kind of violently, it feels like you could have just broke your foot right off of your lower leg. You know how you like bend your foot over? I did that and it wasn't a rock and it wasn't ice. I just did it. And then there was all these things that happened in my head that of course I can't communicate as quickly as they happened. And I'm sure you can relate because you've done this uh, to running, playing a sport for me, just walking from my car to the office. I'm quite prone. Uh, very quickly, the first thing that went through my head was like, thank you, God. And not in kind of the, I mean, the, the cuss word sense, but just like the like, thank you. Because there was this sense of like, uh, running is an important part of my economy and I'm sure I could reinvent myself if I had to, but that would have been really terrible if I had to pick my foot up off the road or if I sprained my ankle really bad and that would kind of readjust my life. And so there was this sincere, just like, thank you, God, followed by, uh, and I don't know if you do this, but I have the ability to, to overthink everything, followed by the, like, was that even accurate? Like, Seriously, like you think God just protected your ankle? Like kids are dying in the Sudan. Little kids have cancer. And you think he just kept your ankle from snapping? Like get real. And then I had a third thought and that was, well, <laughs> either way, I think I win if I just choose a posture of gratitude. You know what I mean? Like I, I think e even if it's grossly inaccurate and all this whole thing is a facade and I'm just playing games, uh, I, I think I and everyone in my life wins if I just choose to, to be grateful. And then I had a fourth thought. And the fourth thought was, Okay, but then that would mean that if you broke your ankle and your foot was lying in the gutter, like to, to take that thought process to its logical end would mean you'd also need to be thankful for that because if God didn't allow the ankle to break, then that would assume that God did allow the ankle to break. And all of that, for, for me, everything came crashing together because I realized this work that I'd been doing on the Lord's Prayer, not knowing necessarily that it was going to be a series uh, that, that all of it came to fruition because I realized is that I think, and I'm going to give you my opinion, which I've uh, mostly, I'm going to steal from Dallas Willard because I don't think for myself. I just read other people's thoughts. But I think that's what encapsulates the, the, the Our Father is that what, what Jesus is doing here, I, I think gives us thoughtful, sincere, honest, 21st century, cognitive, like non-trite response to these questions like, how do you place the bad things? Like how, how, and this is part of what I love about this. That this is not a Christian question. It's not a religious question. It's not a God question. It, whether, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic, whether you, whatever it is you believe about the divine or don't believe, we all have to just answer this question. How do you place the bad things? How do you place childhood cancer? How do you place cancer in general? How do you place betrayal and divorce and financial crisis and disappointment and suffering and Sudan and like you, I often think, man, I wonder if it was easier when just you lived in Capernaum and you didn't ever leave Capernaum and, and all of a sudden all the only thing you knew were 200 people and, and you didn't know what was happening because there was no CNN or Fox News or internet, but you do. And it brings to the floor just this question, like how do you place it? Uh, fast forward a couple months ago to a couple, well, fast forward a couple months uh, from that point to just a couple weeks ago, 
Uh, it was a Thursday night, and a I knew that all-star tryouts were that following Saturday and Sunday, and I knew my boys really wanted to try out and were hoping to make the team. I also knew that the all-star coaches were guys who loved to put the pitching machine on the mound and just fire 20 balls at them and go like, how'd you do? The rest of your future is determined on that moment. And so I also knew that, that my, my boys hadn't hit off a pitching machine yet this year. And though we practiced a lot, um, we hadn't drug it out. And then I, I don't coach. I mean, I, I'm the lurking parent, you know, like, like how'd he get in the dugout? I don't know. He's got a kid on the team. Like, it's kind of, <laughs> Kind of my role, kind of. And one of the coaches had given me the combination to the little shelter that had the pitching machine. And so I was like, hey, boys, tomorrow after work, do, do, do you want to go to the fields and we'll set up the pitching machine and we'll kind of do that whole thing and you'll, you'll get a practice. And they were excited about that. So after work, uh, my poor wife, who sometimes calls baseball my mistress, um, she picks me up from work and we get to the fields and set the machine up and do all that. And, and I've learned by now, because uh, I have a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old playing baseball, that... Uh, brain thinks at one pace and body responds at another. So I've learned like when I'm throwing BP to get out the, like the old guy thing, you know, that you put in front of you so you don't get bean by the ball. For whatever reason, I didn't think of it on this particular day. And I think I was thinking pitching machine. And so I th- set the thing up and my youngest went first and he had a couple close ones that like hit the spinning wheel or whatever. And it's kind of strange because there's no place to, it's like, I can't catch it because it's coming at this machine and I'm behind the machine. And I, I started to get the sense that this wasn't very smart. And then my 10 year old got up there and we were only a few pitches in, and I should have known better because he's just a classic leadoff, like line drive up the middle kind of hitter. And he hit this liner like this far off the ground. And, and my brain said, jump. Don't know why I opted with jump. Could have said left hand down, catch the ball. My brain said, jump. My muscle fiber says, like a white guy. <laughs> Sorry if that's offensive. So I jumped about this far off the ground. And, and I, I took a liner right there. Uh, I was going to show you a picture, but then I was like, I don't want to be that person who shows you my foot. That's disgusting. Uh, and my wife says it's a bone contusion, and I'll have a bump there for the rest of my life. So for like a week, I didn't run, and I hobbled around. Actually, what happened is it kind of hurt then, you know, but you kind of like another coach was watching. He's like <laughs> laughing at me. So you, you, you kind of like just suck it up, you know. And then the next day, I helped with tryouts, so I was on my foot all day. So by the time I went to bed, it, it kind of hurt. It really hurt. <laughs> And then I woke up at 1 a.m. Like, so my alarm goes off at 4.30 on Sundays. I woke up at 1 that Saturday night. And if you'd have told me someone transplanted my heart from my chest to my ankle, I'd have bought all of it. And I, I, I prayed the Lord's Prayer like 1,700 times that night because I did not sleep a wink. I didn't run for over a week. I, I mean, I'm kind of complaining. All that to say, uh, this last Tuesday, I was thinking about this, this, uh, the content this morning. And I thought, you know what? You know what I never did? Never once did I say, thanks God for the liner to the ankle. I mean, the thought never, I mean, I wasn't mad. I didn't blame. It just, the thought never even occurred to me. So what I want to explore this morning is how the Lord's Prayer, I think, challenges on this. And listen, I get that some of you are disgusted because what you're dealing with is way more than a bone contusion on your ankle. Some of you are dealing with cancer, with divorce, uh, that there's a family in the 830 that's, that's dealing with childhood cancer. Some of you are dealing with, with just a, being at a, an age and a stage in life, and you didn't think the circumstances would look like this. And I get that it's, it's hard. And I guess the question that I want to ask is, is simply this. How, how do we relate to God in the anticipation of suffering and the actual experience of it? Because here's what we know. We're all going to die. And every married couple, someone's saying goodbye to someone. And even if they die together, they have to go through it alone. And so there's this stuff. How how do we relate to God in in the midst of it? And this is where I think uh, the the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer can help us. Look at Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 13. We're just going to look at the last part. Uh, And here Jesus says this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So here's my question. What if... What if Jesus would actually prefer that you relate to him on the basis that you'd prefer life not to be difficult? Uh, go ahead to that next slide. Like, what if Jesus gives us, what if what he's doing here is, is giving us permission to the request that we not face difficulty? Because listen, we're going to get into this. I think sometimes those of us within the, the church sector, I think we've almost idolized our theology of suffering. 
And while we have to give thoughtful response to suffering, I wonder if sometimes we've misunderstood God's desire. There are spiritualities and worldviews that hold God prefers that you suffer. I guess my question is, is that the way Jesus saw God? And what if instead of going like, okay, God, you see what I put in the offering plate? Now, please heal me. What if God is perfectly okay with you just saying to him, hey, God, my preference would be to be healthy and have my kids healthy and for my business to work and cancer to be cured, for the infertility to get solved. Like my, my preference, God, would just be that you shelter me from the hard stuff. What if he's not threatened by that? In fact, Dallas Willard says it this way. Uh, go ahead, next slide. It says, the first request asks our father not to put us to the test. Now, we're going to get to James because some of you are going like, wait a minute, doesn't James say something else? We're going to get there in the context of there. But what if, like, and lead us not into temptation. Isn't every trial, every doctor visit, every divorce, every bounced uh, check, every disappointment, it's, it's a temptation, isn't it? It's a temptation to, to no longer trust God. And I'm going to guess that I'm not the only one that goes, Lord, I'm not sure that my faith is secure enough to endure that. What if God, part two here, and maybe this is my first ever three-point sermon, uh, what if second here, what if Jesus uh, is saying, hey, you know what you know would be really good for you? Just to confess that you're weak and so is your faith. What if we've misunderstood the disciples when they say, uh, our, our faith is weak, give us more? What, what if that's part of what Jesus loved about them was the simple acknowledgement of like, whew, it's weak. I don't know that I can do this. What, what, what if God's okay with that? In fact, what if the Lord's prayer is here saying, just, just tell him. Now notice the Lord's prayer, it starts with the glorification of God, and we're going to kind of go through this in just a second. But notice how it ends. Let, let's just kind of review real quickly. It starts, our Father in heaven, which remember is like this God who is near. He's close at hand. He's right here. And he moves into, hallowed be your name. Like, God, my life's not about you or about me, but about you. It's not about me, but it's about you. That, that's the hallowing piece. And then it moves into this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which we've talked about. God made you for domain. He's not threatened by that. That's what it means to be human. But the invitation, the gospel is the opportunity to say, God, I want to run my domain, my queendom, my kingdom, your way, as though you were in charge. I guess this last weekend reminded me of this in some regard, and, and I'm sorry if this is offensive, but like the Blackfoot Brewery, um, I would unapologetically say there's, they, I, I learned much from them. And I tell Brian, the owner there, and he's become a friend and, and a bit of a coach even uh, th through that whole deal. Like I say, Brian, uh, if, if we could just treat people the way you treat people, if we could treat employees the way you treat employees, if we could have a high view of people the way you guys do, I, I tease him like, uh, and, 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 and again, I, he, he's not a part of this, so don't see me saying that at all. I said, Brian, you, you run the best church in town if what we're talking about is how you treat people. My point there is simply that's the kingdom thing. Like, God, I want to do it in my kingdom the way you do it in yours. Glorification of God. Preeminence of God. But then it transitions. Give us our daily bread. It's a request. It's a God, I have needs. And then it moves into and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors which is this reminder of I'm screwed up and I mess up and I'm going to require grace if we're going to have a relationship, God, which means I better maintain that same posture in my relationships with people or else I kind of betray the entire deal. And then it leads into this. And leads not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Do you see how it starts with this strong glorification of God and it ends with this humble acknowledgement of, of weakness? What if Jesus, when he says, hey, uh, Lord, protect me from temptation. What if he's saying, you, you know what would serve you really, really well? If rather than venting those fears and those insecurities and those doubts and that sense of insignificance and that sense of uh, unorthodoxy and that sense of like, God, I don't know how much I really, rather than vent those in all kinds of other ways, just tell him. And in fact, what if faith comes out sideways when we don't do this? What if the alternative of this kind of self-assured level of faith, what, what, if, what if that's the very thing Jesus is trying to save us from? Do you remember James and John and the story of them? Uh, there are these two brothers. 
they, they were very close friends of Jesus. It would seem like they were in the inner circle of Jesus. And towards the end of what we know was Jesus' life, they thought it was the beginning. They were waiting for him to set up this government on earth. He knew he was going to the cross. And remember, they like, they, they're having this conversation like, who gets to run for president with Jesus? We should, we should. And then there's this whole thing that's happening. And so we don't even know how it happens, but we know their mom gets involved. And it's like her mom uh, uh, approaches Jesus and is like, hey, we really think that, I really think my daughter should be starting on the basketball team. Yeah, but she can't dribble. I know, but she should still be starting. And she's, he, they're, she's making this argument for her disciples. Like, they want to sit at your right and left. They should sit at your right and left. And Jesus, remember what he says to them? Look, look at Matthew 20. Jesus, part of what I love here and stands out to me that it's incredible leadership, like hovering mom addresses Jesus. Jesus just turns his attention to the kids. Like, okay, not, not doing that thing. Just going to talk to you and listen to what he says. Uh, what is it you want? Oh, wait, I'm, I'm a verse early. She says, grant this request. They need to start on the team. And then he said, he just turns to them, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the, tu- from the cup I am going to drink? Now, we talked in Easter 2015 about the human side of the crucifixion. That the Romans held a competition for, like, what's the most brutal form of death that we can come up with that keeps people along the, uh, alive the longest and therefore it causes them to experience the most amount of torture and what won the competition, it was like, you know, like we would have these uh, trade shows for it. But they had this thing for, for killing people, slowly but surely. And crucifixion won the day. And it was so brutal that they were like, okay, so what are we going to cause the, what are we going to call the pain associated with this? Like, what do we call this thing? And they go like, it's an iPod. We've got to invent a word. They came up with the word excruciating. That's where the English word comes from. It speaks specifically to the pain involved with dying by crucifixion. Jesus is like, do you, do you have any idea what you're asking? And look at their response. Yeah, we can. Eh. I mean, never mind that if the average person got, took a hit on the football field, their head would come completely off their shoulders. Yeah, we can do this. Like, we should start. What if Jesus is going like, listen, listen, listen. Just, just confess to God that you'd really like to not suffer. You'd like to live until you're about 83 and then die in your sleep. Right? I don't know. You'd like your kids to be healthy. You, you don't want to be rich, but you'd like to pay your bills. And what if Jesus says, and you just acknowledge, like make it a part of your rhythm that you're not sure how you would cope if that weren't the case. You know, I realized that, that the failure to do this came out sideways for me uh, five or six years ago. It was in this season of my life where it, I, I don't, I started following Jesus at 19. I don't feel like I've ever lost faith, but I certainly lost faith in prayer, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And all this came to fruition for me. I was uh, was invited by the city to be a part of this grant. They got this grant from the CDC. They had to put together this team of 10 people from across the community, and the first task was to fly to the East Coast, to Baltimore, where these 10 people would go through this training. And uh, everything about that experience was both an opportunity and, quite honestly, uh, was just like the the culmination of what gave me anxiety. I'd like to think I'm getting better, but... You know, I get on an airplane, fly to the East Coast by myself, stay in a hotel room by myself, walk streets in a city I don't know with people I don't know. And the first night there, I was actually walking the Inner Harbor and this, out of nowhere, this kind of gangster guy like left a crowd of people and took a swing at me out of nowhere. And like I ducked. I think he was trying to get my cell phone in hindsight because I'm pretty sure he'd hit me square in the nose if he was really trying to punch me. But I think he was grabbing my cell phone and it was just going to take it. And then I like ducked and these two women had to get between me and him and it was really, really terrible and traumatic. (laughs) So... The whole thing was just not fun. And I don't know about you, but when it's t- when, like the day to fly home, I just wish every airplane left the airport at 6 a.m., right? Like, like two o'clock departures are the worst because I just want to get up and go to the airport because there's all this stuff to worry about, right? Like, like tires are going to fall off the plane and cancellations. And I-, I was to the point, in hindsight, I was to the point where I wasn't sure if I could emotionally handle staying another night in Baltimore. And certainly I could have, but that was my emotional state. Like, God, get me the heck out of here. And I spent, I had a whole bunch of time in the morning to worry about all the reasons why I wouldn't get out of there. I remember getting to the airport and walking up to the kiosk to check in. And, and, and the first message that came up was like, hey, this flight is overbooked. Would you like $25 at Applebee's to stay behind for the next three weeks? <laughs> and, and I remember looking for the like, hell no button. Like, that's my... <laughs> No, I do not want to stay behind. (laughs) And I can recall wanting to pray, God, I really want to get home. 
and feeling, how could I bug God about that when there's kids in Sudan? And not even believing that he cared or that he was even involved in that. But I wonder, what if Jesus is saying quite the opposite? What if Jesus is going, hey, God's big enough for all of it. Don't couch it, don't hide it, acknowledge it. And I wonder, had I been emotionally aware of that, A, of the permission to ask not to suffer, but, but then, and, and, and here's where Dallas Willard takes this, and it would take some study, but let me just put this out there for your consideration, because here's where he goes, his, his part three here. Go ahead, part number three. What if Jesus offers us the assurance that when we do suffer, God let it through for a reason? What if it's okay And listen, I understand this could sound trite. It could sound superficial. It could sound like religion at its worst. I get all that. But what if on the one hand, there's permission that God save us from suffering, protect us from it in the first place. But second to that, that we can flip a switch mentally and go, I don't know why I'm still in Baltimore. Maybe there's an Orioles game. Like, I don't know why I'm here. But I'm trusting that because I have permission to ask that I'm not, suddenly I can click into, Lord, what's going on here? See, this is where I think we can get into the James stuff. Because James, and let's just read it because uh, this is important and motivating stuff, but, but I think we've got to put it in context. Listen to James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds which is absurd, and and we're talking deep maturity here, because you know that the testing of your faith uh, produces perseverance, Let perseverance finish its work that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There's your theology of suffering. You know what the context of James is? All they had to do was renounce their faith in Jesus and they get to go home. Like the, 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 the context is people were dying. They were holding memorial services and the only reason they had to hold them was because they were believing in Jesus in the context of Jerusalem and the areas around it and it was brutal. All they had to do was say, I'm out. James is not, in my estimation, championing suffering for suffering's sake. And he's not suggesting that this is some kind of dark, devious God who would prefer to torture you, maybe like an unjust parent. What he is saying here is, hey, here's some perspective. Here's what James is saying. Here's some perspective to your suffering. Which I guess I'm suggesting, what if Jesus is saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So pray that God protects you from it. Acknowledge that you're weak within it. And then just know that if it got through, he's doing something. Listen, you've had that coach, right? And I understand this could be trite. You've had the coach, right, that you hated. The instructor, the person who just, during the season, you despised them. And you look back now, and you saw they were leading you to a place that you didn't even know you wanted to get to. Aren't they... Aren't they the the ones that now, 20 years later, you have the most respect for? And can that go too far? Of course it can. What if this is the way Jesus invites us to relate to God in the midst of our suffering? And see, this would require that, that we kind of unpack, okay, so what about all those big flowery promises that come up so much in the text that depending on where you're at in your spiritual journey, they, they may be offensive to you and they might be on your coffee mug and all of it's in play. Like think, think of Psalm 91. Let's just look at Psalm 91. Because in Psalm 91, I, I know for me, there was a big season of my life where there was like, okay, Lord, we have this value around here, not over-promising so that we under-deliver. Like let's under-promise and over-deliver. Sure feels to me like you're over-promising. L- listen to, to, to verse nine. If you say, the Lord is my refuge. So if you say, the Lord is my refuge, like, and you make the most high your dwelling, No harm will ever overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. Seriously. I mean, seriously. How does a thoughtful Christ follower even engage that? Listen to verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Seriously, is this not the stuff that can get us in trouble? What do we do here? L- listen to what Dallas Willard says here. I, I, I just, this quote to me would be worth memorizing. He says, but the scriptures do not promise no trials. They promise unbroken care along with God-given adequacy to whatever happens. 
God, I'm weak. And yet I fully believe that if I were called to face that thing that I dread, you would give me a booster shot that would make it suddenly doable to honor you. This, it strikes me, is the way Paul understood the divine. Listen in 2 Corinthians. Paul, far from, I think, what is often represented, doesn't seem to say like, please, please torture me. That would be my preference. Rather, he seems to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me offer some perspective. But he said to me, this is after he was just begging God, please, God, don't make me suffer. My, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power, power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, and he's not cussing, he's saying, like, for his sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Remember Jesus on the eve of going through the most important moment in human history. What did he say to God? Oh God, this is so great. I'm so glad I get to do this. What did he say? Hey Lord, if you could send a drone, that'd be great. Like if we could not do this, that'd be awesome. And then he says, but we're doing it. Okay, so thanks that you're empowering me. What if God gives you full permission? And as we talk about this prayer as something we do daily, each of the six parts, what if God knows that it would serve you and therefore those that he's called you to love well if you made room every day for the acknowledgement of weakness? That if you just simply said to your heavenly father, Hey, God, I, I'd prefer that you just save me from, from the stuff that would test me. And what if part of what it means to be the people of God in the context of community is to know that in the midst of, of the blast and in the midst of the jolt, when merging is required because suddenly we are suffering, that it's the job of, of God through his people to rein in and offer not, not trite, superficial perspective, but to bring us back to the word that goes, wait, 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 wait a minute. You've lived in the assurance that God will protect you. You have lots of evidence of different times when he did. This time he didn't. So let's learn together what it means to trust. Listen, I don't know where you're at in your faith journey. I do know that sometimes we, we misrepresent it like we're either in one spot or another. It's much more dynamic than that. What we see from the scriptures are, are, are a Christ who claims to be God and represent God. And he seems to know him in very specific ways. And the invitation is within that journey to transition from admiring him to actually jumping onto the team and doing the push-ups with him. And at times that requires that what makes sense to him and makes no sense to us, we're going to go with the him part of that. That's what it means to follow this whole thing, God, it makes no sense to me. It's so opposite of culture, but this is what you say. And I'm going to put myself out there. Listen, I, I think if you're exploring faith or even trying to grow in faith, what's, what's the next right thing that God is calling you to do? And within the difficulty and sincerity of that, you'll, you'll discover the essential nature of God's grace with you. It won't lead you from God. It'll lead you to him. I don't know where this is at for you, whether you have the privilege of it being academic or you're staring it right in the face. Uh, I'm very proud of the band and the, and the song that they've kind of prepared to help us kind of walk out of this, not this this morning, but this series. So I'd like to pray and then we're going to sing. God, thanks, Lord, that, uh, that you don't lead us into a charade. And in all sincerity, your text is not this idealized representation of life. That it's honest and sincere. Thanks, God, that the text doesn't even offer us this comprehensive explanation for why evil. Why disease and betrayal and adultery and addiction and cancer. But what it does offer us is an explanation as to what you're doing about it. 
and the invitation to do something about it with you. God, would you, would you give us the courage to do the very thing that maybe to us betrays all good sound theology and that is just acknowledge that we're not even sure that we have the faith uh, to follow you through that. To trust that you will protect us from, from lots of it. And to know that you draw close when, when you don't. That you have something better in mind. God, as we walk with friends and family members, uh, would you somehow, please, God, help us avoid the trite, superficial statements that are born of sincerity but just sound dumb. Would you help us be present in ways that are faithful to you and our friendships? Amen. If you'd like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.